Good morning and welcome to worship on this World Communion Sunday. Today we celebrate communion with God's people all over the world. I would invite you to, before we begin, either pause the video or just run quickly and grab some bread and some juice, whatever you have laying around, cookies, uh, a Capri Sun, whatever it is, it's okay. Uh, the important thing is that we're celebrating this holy meal together. Nos reunimos desde el occidente y hasta el oriente, desde el sur y hasta el norte, para celebrar al Dios de paz que nos acompaña en nuestras acciones de paz. Este Dios de paz nos acompaña en todas las circunstancias que nos rodean. Le alabamos. Amén. A number of prayer requests have been shared with me this week, and I share them now with you. Lisa H. is asking prayers for Morena, who is battling cancer. Miriam P. has said, asking you, please pray for Liz as she seeks new employment, and thank you all for the prayers for Abby as she has just finished her week at her new job. Things seem to be going well, so Miriam asks that you please keep those prayers coming. Marcia M. is asking prayers for Kenny, who's having surgery on Tuesday. And from Carlene R., please pray for my friend Andresha and her three beautiful children. She says they recently fled domestic violence and are starting all over and are meeting all the blockades and roadblocks one could imagine. Let us also pray for the family of Tamari Rodriguez, the second child in two weeks to be killed by gun violence here in Troy. This week we have one birthday. Susan M. has a birthday this Friday. So happy birthday, Susan. I invite you to lift up your prayers of thanksgiving, your concerns, whatever is on your heart at this time. Let us lift those prayers up together. We stand in awe of your con of your creation, O oh God. We gaze at the autumnal leaves and the indications that change is coming. We begin to think about the winter ahead and make preparations for the differences that come with these changing seasons. Help us to turn our hearts to you, O oh God, as we begin to settle down into more predictable routines. Let us always be mindful of the needs of others. This morning, we lift up in prayer the names of loved ones who struggle with illness, with grief, alienation, sorrow. We share their situations, which weigh heavily on our hearts. We also share those things which make our hearts and spirits dance with joy. God, in your spirit of joy, hear these praises. May your light shine upon us as we offer these names and concern and joy, illuminating our way and guiding our lives. Amen. <laughs>
and a prayer for illumination. We give thanks, O God, of sacred stories for the witness of Holy Scripture. Through it, you nurture our imaginations, touch our feelings, increase our awareness, and challenge our assumptions. Bless, we pray, our hearing of your word this day. Speak to each of us, speak to all of us, and grant by the power of your spirit, we may be hearers and doers of your word. Amen. The first reading today is from Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me now sing of my friend. It is a love song about a vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. My friend dug the soil, cleared the stones, and planted the choicest vines. Then within it built a watchtower and constructed a wine press. My friend anticipated the crop of grapes, but what it yielded was wild grapes. Now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I, that I haven't done? Why, when I looked for the crop of grapes, did it bring forth bad fruit? Now I will let you know what I mean to do with my vineyard. Take away its hedge, Give it over to grazing, break through its wall, let it be trampled. I will let it go to wilderness. It will not be pruned or hoed, but overgrown with thorns and briars. I will command the clouds not to send rain upon it. The vineyard of the God omnipotent in the house of Israel and the people of Judah are God's cherished vine. God looked for justice, but found bloodshed for righteousness, but found only a cry of suffering. Our second reading this morning is from Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a property owner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, installed a wine press, and erected a tower. Then the owner leased it out to tenant farmers and went on a journey. When the vintage time arrived, the owner sent aides to the tenants to divide the shares of the grapes. The tenants responded by seizing the aides. They beat one killed another, and stoned a third. A second time, the owner sent even more aides than before, but they treated them the same way. Finally, the owner sent the family heir to them, thinking, they will respect my heir. When the vine growers saw the heir, they said to one another, here's the one who stands in the way of our having everything. With a single act of murder, we could seize the inheritance. With that, they grabbed and killed the heir outside the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to those tenants? They replied, the owner will bring that wicked crowd to a horrible death and lease the vineyard out to others who will see to it that there are grapes for the proprietor at vintage time. Jesus said to them, did you ever read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It was our God's doing and we find it marvelous to behold. That's why I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to people who will bear its fruit. Those who fall on this stone will be dashed to pieces, and those on whom it falls will be smashed. 
When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they realized that Jesus was speaking about them. Although they sought to arrest him, they feared the crowds who regarded Jesus as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Speak to us today, O God, not what I would have to say, but what you are to have each of us to hear. Amen. So last week I found out that a beloved professor from my seminary, Dr. Ann Johnston, had died. She was this awesome professor of the Hebrew scriptures, and she fostered within me a deep appreciation for the Hebrew language, and particularly within the book of Isaiah. And as is often the case with translated writings, what we found is that there's a lot of nuance that we miss when we don't read the Hebrew scripture in its original language. And in fact, this reading from Isaiah was one of Dr. Johnston's favorite passages to use as an example. When we translate the literal meaning of this text, we miss out on all the puns, the rhymes, the wordplay, the poetry of the original language. We get a little bit of a hint of it, though, in verse 2, where God, the vineyard owner, planted a vineyard with choice vines, expecting it to yield sweet grapes, when it instead yielded rotten grapes, sour grapes. Unfortunately, we completely miss out on the beauty of what the writer is saying in verse 7, where the puns are absolutely impossible to translate. It says, God looked for justice, mishpat, but found bloodshed, mispak. God expected righteousness, tzedaka, but found only a cry, tzaaka. Now, a similar type of wordplay in English might be, I was hoping my friend would be cool, but instead she gave me the cold shoulder. Or, I tuned into the presidential debate this week, and whether or not there was anything presidential about it is debatable. If those sentences were translated into another language, that wordplay would be lost. But these are the kinds of things that help us remember stories, remember bits of scripture. And it would have helped those hearing Jesus retell the story. The chief priests and Pharisees would have recognized immediately that Jesus was referring to Isaiah as he talked about a landowner who planted a vineyard, built a hedge around it, installed a wine press, and built a watchtower. They'd have known exactly where Jesus was going with this parable. And they probably wouldn't have liked it a whole lot. See, Isaiah was speaking about God's condemnation of Israel. This passage comes just before Isaiah prophesies about the invasion and destruction of the nation as judgment for their lack of love and justice. From the nation of Israel, God expected justice, but found bloodshed. God looked for righteousness in Israel and found only cries of suffering. So the promised land was taken away from the Israelites and allowed to fall into enemy hands. And so as Jesus used this story to introduce his parable, he shifted the focus of his condemnation from Israel to the priests and the Pharisees. And as they heard the story, they were not supposed to identify with the landowner's aides and heirs. Instead, we find that they pronounced their own judgment as the tenants in this parable. See, Jesus asked them, he said, who do you suppose the owner, or what do you suppose the owner of the vineyard is going to do to those tenants? And the Pharisees and priests replied, well, the owner's going to bring that wicked crowd to a horrible death and lease the vineyard out to others who will bring good fruit 
for the proprietor. And Jesus responded, I'm telling you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will bear its fruit. Jesus has taken special care to place this judgment within the context of justice, or rather the lack thereof. God looked for justice among the Pharisees, among the priests, but found bloodshed. God expected righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Those who fail to pursue justice will be judged and found lacking. All that they have will be taken away from them and given to the ones who are pursuing justice. And so I ask you today, where should we see ourselves in this parable? As, as individuals, where should we see ourselves as a city, as a nation? Are we like the aides and heirs who come into the world to serve the vineyard owner only to be persecuted and killed? Or are we the ones to whom the vineyard has been given? Have we taken this beautiful vineyard, this beautiful earth, and used it up until all it produces is rotten fruit? How many times and in how many ways have we pronounced our own judgment. This week I saw my own condemnation as I drove past a man asking for food and looked away while my takeout bag sat on the seat beside me. I saw our city's condemnation as those who participated in the cover-up of Edson Thevenin's death walked away free. I saw our nation's condemnation as we continue to whine about discomfort and wearing masks while 200,000 people and counting have died. Notice how the violence in this passage is not being levied by an angry and vengeful God. Now, it's the tenants who have turned the vineyard owners, turned on the vineyard owners' representatives, who have murdered the owner's heir. And even after the Pharisees and priests have declared that the just response on the part of the vineyard owner really would be to bring that crowd to a horrible death, Jesus doesn't call for a perpetuation to that violence. Instead, Jesus tells them that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to those who bear good fruit. This great vineyard, this beautiful earth has been given to us to care for and to tend. But injustice contains within it the seeds of its own destruction. If we cannot care for our planet, we're going to lose it. If we cannot do what is right and necessary to protect the most vulnerable in our world, that rising death toll is on our heads. Jesus changes the metaphor one final time in this passage. And he asked the priests and Pharisees, have you read where the scriptures say the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? He says, those who fall on this stone will be dashed to pieces. Those on whom it falls will be smashed. Now this isn't a threat. This is a statement of fact. Those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword when we cannot or do not address the root causes of violence and injustice in this world, we will be crushed under the weight of it. 
If we continue to ignore climate change or the unequal treatment of our black siblings, it's our planet and our society that suffers. But my friends, there is hope. See, in the biblical story of Noah and the great flood, the first thing that Noah did after the floodwaters had dried up, Noah first built an altar to God. And then he built a vineyard. Not a house. Not something for himself, but a vineyard. Probably because starting a vineyard is tough work. It's long work. It takes a lot of time and resources to prepare the land and care for the young plants. And there's no harvest for the first three to five years. Sometimes planting a vineyard means planting it for the generation to come. Vineyard owners must be prepared for the long haul. And I tell you that God is in this for the long haul. On this World Communion Sunday, we are reminded now more than ever just how interconnected we all are throughout the world and how what we do affects others. God has created this vineyard, all of its inhabitants within it, with love and with care. And God has no plan to abandon it to the wanton whims of greed and violence. We are but tenants here. Yet we have been entrusted with this vineyard. For ourselves, but also for the coming generations. So let us work for justice, so that when the harvest time comes, God will indeed find the good fruit of justice and righteousness rather than that cry of distress. Amen. Esta é a mesa para a qual Jesus nos convida. Vamos participar com alegria. Talanta Mesha, Cristo te ajeitou. Como a Jesus Mesa? A Enya não é nem gente. Não é nem muito mina. Vou abrir em viver. Esta é a mesa a la que Jesus nos invita. We remember that night that Jesus gathered at the table with his friends, his disciples, and had one final meal with them. 
And he took the bread that night, and he blessed it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body. And after supper, as Jesus looked forward to these days to come, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks to God. And he said, take all of you and drink from this. It's the cup of a new kind of covenant, one poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And he asked his disciples that as they came together and shared in these elements, these foods of life, that they tell his story and remember him. And so we do that today with all those around the world who follow Jesus. Come now, Holy Spirit of God, as you were present in creation, be present here with us now. Let these gifts of bread and cup be for us the bread of life and the cup of blessing. As you were sent by Jesus to accompany us on our journey of faith, be present now. Transform our community as we share this bread and cup into one body in Christ, united with all in this community and around the world. Amen. The bread of life broken for you. Take and eat. Amen. And the cup of new life poured out for you. Amen. And now, O God, on this World Communion Sunday, when we celebrate the whole world coming together at Christ's table to know your grace and to feel your presence, we pray together, joining across time and space, in the words you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas, así como también nosotros perdonamos a quienes nos ofenden. Amén. Amen. 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 Just a note, my friends, before uh, I give you the, the blessing and we part ways this morning, I want to let you know that I'll be on vacation for the next two weeks. We will still have our coffee chats on Sundays and Wednesdays via Zoom. And uh, if you need that link, go ahead and check that out on our uh, website unitedpresstroy.org. One of the great blessings to come out of this pandemic time is the variety of online worship uh, services there is to be found. And so for the next two Sundays, October 11th and 18th, I invite you to go um, to a service across town, to a service around the world, and join with them in worship. And then on October 25th, we will once again come again, come together as community, and we will do so both in person here in the sanctuary as we reopen our sanctuary for worship, and also live stream it for anyone who remains at home or does not feel comfortable coming out for service. I look forward to seeing you again in three weeks on October 25th. 
my friends. Let the light of God's love shine on you, in you, and through you as you go into God's world to serve God's people. Go with the blessing of the Creator and of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.